Okay, so um, you will notice uh, there will be some QRs where you you can quickly get a hold of a book, but you can pick up the slides. Um, these are for the slides, but um, uh, you can uh, you can find the links and and things afterwards once you have the slides. So that's what that is. We uh, are are making a video of this. And we even have a site of the video if you have to drop out or want to recommend a friend to see it later, that kind of thing. And my first uh, uh, offering to you, aside from the slides, is a book um, uh, called Value Agile, which is mainly what I based my previous talk to you on. This is really analyzing the uh, Agile Manifesto and coming up with some constructive suggestions moving in the direction of um, delivering value at each sprint, not just code, which people think is value. And there are my contacts, and I'm very happy if somebody wants to write me an email or join me on LinkedIn or follow me on Twitter. Uh, so there, uh, there's the opportunity to do it. Right. First, uh, what I call my agile credibility, um, uh, I, I find it's a nice way to start an Agile talk to say I'm the grandfather and I can prove it. Uh, uh, mainly I got a lot of uh, credit from the guys who signed the manifesto, uh, specifically referring to my 1988 book that they uh, read, uh, which has an awful lot of stuff about Agile in it. And uh, uh, all, all the books, everything I write has to do with Agile, make no mistake about it. But this was 1988, so wasn't that about 12 years before Agile Manifesto? So um, <clears throat> Mike Cohn pointed out recently that he named his mountain goat company for a mountain goat principle, a principle of incremental delivery and ratcheting things in, which was in my book, and he's quite happy with that. Uh, I've been practicing Agile uh, since about 1960. I look back and I did uh, a 20 value delivery step project just intuitively. But looking back, it is what we today call Agile. Of course, we didn't have a name for it then. I just took one step at a time and made sure they worked. I've been preaching Agile for since the uh, 70s at least. And at the very back of uh, all the slides here, I've, um, uh, I've got some uh, uh, two large pages of detail regarding what I published early, what I said, and, and what the, uh, the other Agilistas said about my work. Uh, we've practiced Agile in a number of corporations. Um, uh, for uh, Hewlett Packard is particularly interesting because they um, – took our, uh, our Agile method, which we call Evo, and spread it throughout the corporation and published things on it. Uh, so that, that's, that's a major interesting corporate adoption. And, and then these are other uh, examples that more or less use or used our uh, methods. Here are some of the key books with Agile content, uh, Software Metrics 1976, that's this fellow here. I just happen to have a copy uh, right here in my office. And uh, um, what I uh, and then um, uh, in uh, 2018, uh, I uh, wrote five uh, books, I promise you they're all agile. And then uh, couldn't stop me in 2019, sitting at my summer cabin in Norway, I wrote five more books. You may have free copies of these there. Uh, these are up on our website, and you have to pay a little bit for them. Unless you're a poor student and just email me, I have a soft heart, you can have any of my books for free, even if they're behind a paywall. Uh, and then this summer, I knew I had to try to write five books, but uh, I managed to write six books. Now, this one's cheating a little bit. It's only about 15 pages, 12 tough questions. But you're welcome to free copies of all of these. So um, I don't expect anybody to read all of them in the coming month, but you could download them, put them in a little uh, Tom Guild library for when you have time. 
What I'd like to do is to read a quotation from this software metrics book, page 214. A complex system will be most successful if it is implemented in small steps. Now, remember, I'm writing this in Big Bang waterfall standardization era. So this is radical. And if each step has a clear measure of successful achievement, and I don't mean the code works. I mean you've achieved something for your customers, users, and your stakeholders, which I call value delivery. For example, it got more secure. It is more user friendly. It is more, uh, has less technical debt. Okay. Anyway, successful achievement as well as a retreat possibility. If it goes wrong, like a bad scientific experiment, you go back to what you had and you dump the whatever didn't work. So a retreat possibility to a previous successful step upon failure of a single step. Now, I, I, uh, I think this is a pretty damn good definition of agile as I see it today and we'll present. So you're welcome to quote me on it if you want a really early quote. Uh, here's a nice one. Gartner Group does some research on these things, and I have to admit to being dead pleased when all these agile variants coming up, but uh, Gartner Group was smart enough to know that uh, the, uh, the, my evolutionary value delivery method, Evo, is one of the roots that, you know, gave, gave rise to the, well, the manifesto and then indirectly at least all these other methods. So I'm, I'm at the root. I am, this is my grandfather proof. For a banking business um, in 2013, we're trying to define, define agile because there are lots of definitions of it, of course, and some of them, like the ones in the manifesto, I don't like very much as I lectured on last time. And that lecture, by the way, uh, is, um, uh, videoed and you can get a copy of it. But here's my definition. Agile is any set of tactics, any methods, that enable us to deliver useful results in a stream, starting early, continuing until we're done, and we have all the improvements we want, in spite of a changing environment. Okay? In other words, uh, uh, no matter what hits you, you still keep that stream going more or less, or you uh, pivot or adjust. So I also like that definition of agile. And what I what I was trying to tell the the bank board of directors actually was that focusing on agile is the wrong thing. Uh, uh, focusing using agile tactics that work and deliver value to the bank that's a good thing. And my advice throughout is focus on results and results are not code without bugs. Uh, uh, they, they are business results, results for stakeholders, improvements and things. And these need to be quantified is one of my major uh, messages. So agile processes is just a means to improve the results or the ends. And the, the, these agile things are only as good as the results you get out of it. That's how you judge agile. Am I getting early good results, measurable results, people dancing in the streets with joy and happiness? Okay. And if, if that is a consequence of using your agile processes, well, agile is a good process. It's providing good. But if it, um, uh, if it simply provides a lot of code and then a failed government project, we have a few of those in Norway, uh, where they were, they did all their code agile. They're still doing it. This is social security administration I'm thinking of. Uh, and yet major scandalous failure firing ministers in spite of, so, so it, in other words, the whole project was a big IT project, but it was a total scandalous failure that everybody knows about. So I'm not very interested in agile that leads to failure. I'm interested in agile that does not fail, cannot fail, and leads to success. So here's a little summary. It's all about quickly changing 
if necessary, to meet goals, whatever goal is. I have formal definitions for it. We'll see that later. Here's a uh, planning cycle. Uh, I think a lot of you are probably familiar with the, the uh, deming Schuert plan, do, study, act cycle. If not, you might like to look it up. Uh, it's a cycle of uh, delivering improvement and learning and delivering improvement and things like that. Uh, our value planning cycle is uh, based on the same idea, except we've got a few more things in there. Uh, we like to start off with stakeholders, which is an improvement because it's broader over customers and users, which is narrow and dangerous. If you just have customers and users, then you don't have the European Union with the um, GDPR law. And we just had a major scandal in Norway. Somebody, uh, tried, Simula, tried to deliver a thing called Smittestop. Uh, in other words, uh, it was uh, tracking the coronavirus transmission. And this became a major scandal at government level because they totally failed to recognize that GDPR and privacy was the law. They were breaking the law. They they said, well, we're going to break the law a little bit. I mean, after all, we're going to save lives here. But but the result was some people felt the law was uh, more important than collecting a lot of statistics that weren't actually necessary for tracing, by the way. So there, there was an example of a current IT scandal. Uh, everybody in Norway knows about it. We all Several million downloaded the app and several million have dumped the app because the stakeholder known as European Union and GDPR law were not consulted for their uh, um, um, necessities and requirements. I'm proud to say that some of my IT friends were up in arms and forced our, our other IT friends building the app to uh, and, and forced the government to act. So... Um, but we're pretty good on COVID here, and we're pretty good on privacy in Norway. Anyway, stakeholders are the source of what some of you would call requirements or objectives. Uh, another synonym is our values, things we value. And uh, that's the first thing I'm going to talk about here in terms of tools. And then uh, from the values, we can say, how are we going to achieve the values? And you're into an area uh, I call solutions, but some of you will call it design. Some of it, some of you will call it uh, architecture. And uh, but this is finding the means to deliver the ends to the stakeholders, which is the whole point of absolutely all projects. Now, once you have a solution. Uh, it, it could happen that the, uh, or, or many, a set of solutions more likely, like, like top 10 solutions. Um, one of the problems is that one of those solutions might take uh, three years to implement, take a simple example. And uh, that's not very agile. So uh, what we do is we decompose large solutions, things that cannot be delivered in a week or two, into smaller solutions, call them sub-solutions or sub-architectures, so that we can do agile, so that we can start delivering little chunks early, get feedback, get learning, get a little credibility. And uh, what, so th this decomposition is uh, theory. We use our minds, but uh, once we've got the decomposition, we can develop or purchase or acquire the uh, uh, sub-solutions. That's called develop. And then we can plug it into probably initially the old system. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a, a believer that normally you should always be plugging into your old system until it disappears and all the bad things with it disappear. That agile should be like the Cheshire cat in Alice in Wonderland and should just gradually, the old system should gradually disappear, but you should use it, the old system so that you can do small early deliveries and get some pain relief uh, to the stakeholders, get something going. And uh, a lot of people don't believe that and they don't practice it, but these are the same people who don't want to take any responsibility for another eight years and their project will fail totally and the uh, sub-supplier will collect a lot of money for nothing. So uh, be careful about these big bang Projects. We are agile, and that means step by step we are going to move towards delivering uh, improvement. 
Now, once you've delivered to the real system, and by definition, probably to uh, real users, customers, or perhaps other stakeholders, you are in a position, if you quantified your values, to measure what happened. And if what happened was a good increase in, in value, like more security, more user friendliness, to try to be a little bit more concrete, then you say, that was great. We learned that we can deliver value early, people are happy with it, and let's take another cycle and maybe pick up some decomposed small solutions and continue until all the goal levels, we call them, of the values are reached. That's the definition of end, is when the quantified goal levels for values are reached. That's when you stop. If you don't run out of resources before, then you have to stop because of lack of resources and maybe beg for some more or give up going any further. Anyway, so this is our value planning cycle, value delivery cycle, or EVO cycle. That's Kai, my son, uh, and he uh, actually did the drawing and has worked with me for 30 years, so he, he's uh, to be credited all over the place. Let me show you uh, some uh, uh, stakeholders. So just before COVID hit badly in Norway, I was holding a public architecture class and uh, we decided what we wanted to play with in the workshop, what we wanted to try and do. And it was, of course, COVID-19 planning. <laughs> so uh, here are some of the uh, stakeholders that, uh, not surprising, a lot of medical stuff and school stuff. And uh, then uh, uh, from each one of these uh, uh, stakeholders, I said, derive their most critical goal. And if you follow the lines here, like the, from the, the uh, Health Institute to collecting information. Uh, uh, so these yellow arrows represent values. In fact, they represent a scale of measure for values. And if you read that list, you can easily understand that monitoring an ep epidemic or collecting information, et cetera, is, is, uh, these are values for a COVID time. Um, now, uh, we're going to take a deeper look at how we quantify <coughs> these values. That's, uh, but uh, right now, I'm going to look at the relationship between the stakeholders and the values. Now, this is, of course, in the middle of a training course workshop. So uh, the students don't, they, they're, it's a two-day course, and that's the end of it. And what they haven't done, they don't get to do. So, uh, so for example, we, we find some stakeholders for which there is no line going towards the values. That means... Nobody took the trouble to ask, what are the emergency response services values? And I'm sure they have some, okay? Like getting accurate information if the COVID patient is dying at home or something like that. But so, the, the, so, this, so there's a kind of incompleteness here, which is very visible. All the stakeholders with no green lines means they're just simply not connected to any critical requirements. And if they have them, well, we have to do more work and, and fill in the blanks and, and find uh, the, for them. Now, here, surprisingly, since I said you will go from your stakeholders to uh, your objectives or requirements, uh, we actually have uh, a requirement, uh, equipment capacity, which has no stakeholder. So it's kind of an orphan. Now, that could mean that nobody cares about it. You don't have to do it. It could mean that Nobody got around to it, or, or they did this instead of this, and time ran out. It could mean a lot of things. But it is an untenable situation to have values that nobody cares about, nobody's responsible for, and nobody can adjust for you in an agile, chaotic situation. You want to you want to get updates from, for example, your stakeholders, and you, you need to know who to go to to talk to. Okay, so values here, simple example. Stakeholders here. And these are digitally connected in a tool called ValPlan. So here's the cycle. Uh, here is a template I made. You, you probably have to en enlarge it to, uh, as I can do here. Uh, to, but I've, I've got different major categories. And the most interesting category is inanimate stakeholders. In other words, they're not people. They're not groups of people. Agreements, architecture, contracts, uh, culture, guidelines, international law, like the GDPR, 
I mentioned uh, plans, processes. It's amazing how many uh, things that are sources of our requirements are not people you can a business analyst can interview. Like, uh, and, and in other words, you can't just interview users and customers. You have to analyze other sources of requirements, like what's the law. And uh, anybody who doesn't in explicitly include this idea in their business analysis is immature, and they're going to have the same cock up of major scandals as we've had in Norway, where the people doing the con con uh, uh, con contagion tracking uh, just really didn't look at the law and ask about the law. Okay. So, uh, but now you can use this as a rough checklist or template, and you should probably uh, tailor it or adopt it to your domain. But if you want to really head start in advanced stakeholder thinking, which I plan to give you here, uh, you, you use this as a checklist and then go through the checklist and ask serious questions like, what do they require from our system? Because if you if you do agile and you've forgotten half of your stakeholders and half of their requirements, you, you are not going to end up delivering what people want. And as in Norway, the parliament and the government will be involved, the ministers will be fired and things like that. That's what happens when you don't pay attention to your stakeholders. Okay. So um, here's a larger picture of the stakeholder uh, map. Uh, think of it as patterns. Each one of these, uh, we're, our, our um, theme here is agile tools. Every one of these is a tool to remind you to think about this type of stakeholder and what they require to be delivered during your agile process. So I, I view these as tools. A little bit more advanced that I intend to get into here. Um, I've been, I'm, one day I'm going to write a book on stakeholders, maybe next summer, almost this summer, but it didn't happen. But here we have some, um, these yellow arrows again. These are the attributes or uh, uh, qualities, if you like, of stakeholders, like how much power they have and, and how much money they have and how much future potential they have. All of these can be quantified. So in a sense, we can analyze and present a stakeholder and why we should prioritize them and why we should listen to them uh, with the help of mapping what they are here. Okay, And then uh, uh, these are also the costs of dealing with stakeholders. And I'm very keen on not only values, but value to cost or value for money. And uh, so th this is a reminder that dealing with stakeholders costs money and time and and other efforts. And uh, here's here's a list of a bunch of uh, um, uh, bright light bulbs, in other words, bright ideas, strategies, architectures, designs. And these are a set of things that we can uh, use in our organization in order to um, uh, deal with our uh, stakeholders. Uh, what you're looking at is a very good picture of what uh, I would call uh, business agile, which has suddenly become very popular, uh, and uh, somewhere around the 12th or 14th of October, I'm going to hold a business agile lecture for the British Computer Society, uh, and I'm, I'm very interested in uh, um, going into that area. I've been spent a little bit too much time in the agile for the programmers and IT people but it's time to go one level up to running business and organizations. And this is my, call it, my entry ticket. Now, another book, if you want it, if you're very interested in requirements and stakeholders and things, uh, download the Value Requirements book, okay? And uh, that's the kind of stuff there. I'm gonna show a little bit of this quickly in the lecture, but I'm not gonna try and teach it in detail. In fact, I spent Saturday eight hours training in these things with uh, value day uh, in Lithuania. And uh, that w was videoed and will be available. But th then, you know, eight hours, I have time to teach the details. Right now, the best I can hope for is I'll show you some details. And some of you will say, that looks interesting. I should probably spend more time on it and learn it. And that's my hope. So it'd be nice if you t told me today or next week, yes, I did get inspired. Yes, I did 
decide to read the book. Yes, I did try it out. Uh, I'm, that, that's what I live for is transmitting the ideas to people who really do them and get value from them. What uh, are uh, value requirements? Uh, well, here's a little picture. Uh, I, I have a graphical language for thinking about systems. We won't get into that, but uh, an oval is functions, what the system does, and values are how well that system does it. So this could be any IT system, but this value could be security from very, very bad, better, 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 maybe incrementally as we're delivering sprints up to some level, which is how good we want it to be. And of course, there's not just one value. This is a simplified diagram. Uh, normally, we're managing at any one level about 10 simultaneous. So multi-dimensional thinking is, uh, I'm going to give you a set of tools for doing the necessary multi-dimensional thinking of managing many values at the same time. Uh, okay. Here are some other requirement types, just to put them on the map. I'm not going to go into detail. There's our friend, the function requirement. Uh, there's a resource requirement. We will look at resources a bit more, but these are budgets and deadlines and things like that. Uh, there, there's an arrow there because they're a variable. Okay, the oval stuff, it's either present or absent, it's binary, etc. And then binary constraints, uh, that's something like uh, you will only uh, use suppliers from Great Britain. And, and that's the little box you put around your whole system of everything you do. And the moment you're thinking of doing something outside of Great Britain, they said, no, no, we have a, uh, a binary constraint or a design constraint, we could call it, which... Uh, uh, says you're not allowed to do that without special permission or something. So just to point out, there are some other requirement types, and we'll deal a little bit mainly with this one, and we won't worry too much about these, but there's plenty in writing about them. Uh, here's another book you're actually going to get a free copy of. Uh, by the way, at the very end of the slides, there are about five pages with links to free downloads, books, and papers. And you'll find this there and you'll, you'll find it elsewhere. But uh, right now, I'm less interested in the whole book. Um, uh, I'm interested in definitions. So here's the notion of requirements. And then here are sub-notions. Here's the function requirement. Okay. Here are performance requirements, also known as objectives and values. Here's quality requirements, part of the value thing. But uh, these are other types of values that are not qualities. And uh, we're going to be looking at the detail down here, how we manage these things. And uh, here's like a design constraint. You, you can only use uh, British labor on British products for legal reasons or something like that. Uh, what I did was I sat down one day and I thought out from what Musk calls first principles, the kinds of requirements we needed to separate from each other. And I defined them thoroughly and with regard to each other. And I put them in a thing called a glossary. And here you have two levels of glossary. Uh, this is the big fat 700 page glossary. If you really want to go into depth about terminology, if you're interested in that. And this is the uh, smaller one, which fits in the back of the, the book there. But you can anything with a with an asterisk here, you can look up the exact definition and they have remained stable for many years. And they're very well thought out if you. Like to, you're very welcome to adopt my terminology if you'd like to have a ready-made, stable terminology. Over 700 terms uh, here. Okay. Now, let's go to a type of requirement that everybody's pretty familiar with in Agile, user stories. My good friend Mike Cohn with his uh, Mountain Goat company, which is an incremental company. Uh, and uh, take a look at this uh, simple user story. As an expert user, I want shortcuts to save me time. Now, uh, actually, I, I like user stories for the following reasons here. Uh, it actually uh, exposes the notion, what I'd call a stakeholder here. It, it has a notion of a requirement here. and has a notion of a justification here. And that's marvelous to get that into uh, a sentence like that gives you a lot of three different classes of important information. So no wonder they've become quite popular because they, they, they do that. However, 
for larger projects than a few programmers mucking about for a few weeks or months. In other words, for example, a government project for the national medical system we're working on now in Norway called Axon, which is like eight to 10 years after a pre-project of eight years, and they're threatening to spend 22 billion Norwegian kroner. Don't worry about, doesn't matter. Of course, it will cost three times as much and it will fail. The big scandal on that right now. Anyway, uh, uh, for larger, more complex projects, I believe that you need to control the value and costs in a better way. You need more information that uh, th this is not enough because there are a lot of unanswered questions. What kind of shortcuts? How much time do you want to save? Uh, what's an expert user? All these kinds of things. Are, there, there's a lot of ambiguity here. There's far too much. So anybody trying to interpret that, I mean, good luck. Everybody interpreting it down to the level of code is going to end up with different interpretations. And somebody's not going to get what they thought they wanted when they approved, say, the user story. So what I believe is we have to uh, decode this, define it, uh, using a planning language I've developed called Planguage. And the first step is to say uh, all, uh, all illities, all values need to be quantified. That's my first. We, I, we know we can do it. We know how to do it. And uh, so you know, the question is actually uh, how much time we're going to save. So first step, not surprisingly, is to define a scale of measure. So I write the, this is a requirements definition. I write the uh, parameter scale, declaring I'm going to give you a scale of measure. And I write down average cycle time in minutes for a task by a user. Now, uh, you'll notice that task could be many different types of tasks, and users could be many different types of users. So what we have here is some general ideas, not fuzzy and unclear ideas, on the contrary, but, but general ideas which uh, will be decoded and defined as needed. Now, this is absolutely agile. It actually enables us to have small and many agile steps. So, so I'm giving you a powerful agile tool, and I'll be talking more about it in future slides here. So, uh, and, and then we have the uh, stakeholders' wish is to get down to six minutes, or to, sorry, save uh, six minutes, yeah, no, no, to get down to the average time is to do the task, right? Six minutes. But uh, there's a notion of a deadline for delivery of the six minutes. And now we get an, uh, an interpretation or definition of task, expert complex tasks, and definition of user expert. Okay, now this could be, let's just say for sake of argument, this is a sprint to do this, okay? So we could, uh, we could take another sprint and try and get down to three minutes. We could take another sprint and uh, take a novice or uh, uh, beginners as user. Uh, we could take another sprint and do simple everyday tasks. Okay, you begin to get an idea that this has something to do with sprints and agile. It's a way of decomposing, this is a major theme in my talk, decomposing um, your problems so that you can uh, build uh, a value stream quickly and frequently uh, and, and quickly achieve the final uh, long-term incremental goals. So uh, let me go a little bit more detail. Here's the notion of that scale of measure. It's, it's a, it's a uh, value which um, could be very bad, even negative. And then it gets better and better and better and better. And here we have a perfect value, like 100% availability or something like that. Along this scale, we have based some basic points. Uh, this point here is what I call the benchmark. This is like where we are, where a competitor is. It's a reference point. Here is a target. That's what we're aiming at in the long term. That's this level and scale. And in the middle, there's a thing we call a constraint, which is the minimum. So this is the minimum you can deliver to be allowed to go live or injected in the current system. And this is what we're really aiming for. So we make a very clear duality or distinction between a numeric uh, constraint 
and a numeric target. The target is success, uh, below the constraint is failure. So we're defining success and failure numerically. Good idea, then people know uh, architects and, and coders and testers and everybody knows what's failure, what's, what's not. And benchmarks are very useful for a variety of purposes, but stake in the ground, reality, knowing. Uh, it'd be kind of silly if you didn't know where you were and you set a target, but you really were. Uh, oh, that's some kind of a thing like a telephone. Okay, not going to happen. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, the... Um, uh, it'd be, be silly if you set as a target something uh, worse than you already had, but you just didn't know that the benchmark was over here, not over here. Okay. Um, now, uh, I, I mentioned the planning language, Planguage. Now, the interesting thing about Planguage, from, I'm getting two points of view now about Agile. One is what I call my IT Agile, and the other is Business Agile. And the, the planning language... Uh, works very well with IT Agile for planning IT projects, but it also is a systems engineering language, and it can be used at the organizational level, like to, to set goals for improving an organization and uh, improve your organization incrementally. And I have some slides on that coming up towards the end. So Planguage is a set of tools. They're all defined in the competitive engineering book, and I'm showing them to you as we go along. They're basically all free. There's no license in anything. You can train yourself if you like. You don't, you don't have to get certified or anything like that. And, um, uh, but uh, let's just say Planguage has order of magnitude 100 small tools. So there's a tool called a tag where we don't have bullet points on important ideas. We really have a proper name. There's a tool called a scale of measure. Uh, most methods have no scale of measure for non-financial values like security and usability, uh, okay? And, and there's another tool, the idea of a benchmark called status, which is your incremental change in your Agile project, okay? This gets updated, for example, every week. And uh, the tolerable level, that's the worst acceptable case. Uh, that's your... Um, uh, um, minimum for survival. Less than that, you're not allowed to deliver the system or consider it deliverable. And wish is success level. Okay. So uh, this is a tool, wish level. I'm going to do all these in a little bit more detail. But this is a tool, this is a tool, this is a tool, this is a tool. And uh, this is a surprisingly interesting tool. I won't talk too much about it. But so when I talk about tools, it's, it's like these little details and many of these little details you can sort of add in to what you're already doing almost one at a time. Like you may realize you have uh, quantitative goals, but you may realize you don't actually have numeric constraints at all. So you could add this one tool. You may realize that nobody bothers to put a number on the status of things in the Agile process or even before you go, and you could just add that in. Uh, the notion of formally defining a scale of measure and then reusing it, all of these implicitly reuse the scale, is something you could add in where you are today quantifying, but you have, yeah, let's call them bad scales of measure for the moment. So here are some simple scales of measure. Uh, uh, just to give you the idea, here's a usability scale, percentage of users who can master the basics with, within first day of use. That's okay. Uh, here, here's something else. Uh, can you do, can you quantify impressiveness? <laughs> well, um, the, the way they sold me a Tesla was they gave me a free test ride, and they knew that just about 99% of everybody who took a test ride ordered a Tesla, <laughs> joined the waiting list. So that was suitably impressed. I have to admit I was most impressed by the 17-inch digital screen, uh, which I think is still bigger than anybody else. I don't know. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, but here's an example of a value that people don't usually quantify, although marketing people probably do. But IT people have no tradition for dealing with that. But IT people are always very interested in usability, but it's amazing how many do not bother 
to uh, state exactly what the usability levels are and engineer them, that is designed to get them, and measure that they got them incrementally in Agile. Uh, it's just a non-starter for the Agile, uh, the Scrum as we know it and things like that. The, um, here, here's a link to Chapter 5 of the Competitive Engineering book, which is specialized on scales of measure. So it has a set of all of these nice-sounding words like uh, availability, maintainability, security, adaptability, upgradeability, usability. Notice that upgradeability, uh, tailorability, flexibility, adaptability, those are technical debt measures, in case you didn't see that first time you looked at them. And everybody's always asking, how do you quantify usability and security? Uh, not to mention maintainability. All engineers know how to do that, you know, mean time to repair. But IT people seem not to know that concept at all. Anyway, uh, long story short, here you have a map uh, over the qualities that are in this chapter. I mean, you can download this right now and take a look. Uh, but I have suggested scales of measure for every one of these. So if you want to know how do I quantify usability or security for my IT project or my organization for that matter, uh, direct, concrete, stable suggestions are found for free at this download site. So that's about 30, 40 tools I just handed you, knowing how to quantify at least a pretty good draft that you can modify to your domain and your taste. Now, I'm going to introduce something that we, we had a peek at earlier. Uh, I, I have a name for it now, a technical name called scale parameters. So uh, when we, in a scale, write in square brackets uh, a word or two, uh, it, what it's doing, it's signaling saying this is something that is not fully and finally defined, and uh, but it will be. And, uh, for example, when you're writing your, your uh, uh, objectives, I can write person type all. That means all people. And I can write the car specs are this Tesla 3 with real, uh, rear wheel drive, four doors from 2019. And I can write down that the safety equipment is front airbag, belt pre-tensioner, etc. So what am I doing? I'm selecting a slice of the action. This, is, by the way, is a modeling technique for those who are interested in better modeling ideas. It's also a way of defining things, and it's also a way of tailoring things to your domain as opposed to general ideas. Uh, 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 but it also becomes a way of slicing uh, big problems into small early sprints so the agile process can deliver high priority combinations early without worrying about a million other things that'll take three more years. So this is a primary, powerful, advanced, agile technique. And uh, so what, we all know we have to somehow decompose into sprint, uh, sprints or chunks. And this is a method for doing it at the level of uh, um, scales of measure and values. Uh, here's a, a diagram we're going to look at a little bit more in a little bit larger version of it. So here's the scale along here. And then uh, each one of these has a set of conditions, which are the, the set of things. We've defined attack types as being these attack types. And we've defined uh, the, you know, the effects as being these effects from the security threat and the stakeholders, these stakeholders. And what we're saying is we are concerned uh, with uh, all of these and not anything else for the moment. Now, I reached a 45-minute uh, thing, and uh, I'm <laughs> hardly gotten started. I cut down so many slides and made them simpler. I thought, well, I'm going to get much further than this. I won't. But uh, I, I think it's going to push on towards the hour warning, and then we'll just stop and, and uh, invite the discussion. So um, uh, next. Now, uh, this is a list of, of um, templates or patterns for things we can quantify, uh, adaptability, usability, etc. 
And what we've done is we've put them into a digital tool, in this case, Valplan. And so when we say, okay, I have, I've got some uh, usability stuff, we can uh, open this window and find what we want, like, uh, uh, let's see, this one here, quality usability, click on it. And uh, the tool, it, what it's doing is looking up a scale of measure, and then it places it in the scale. And we can then modify it from there. We can add and subtract and so on. But in a sense, you can auto, you can automatically look up from a library, which I give you a starting library, about 40 of the most usual things. But here, you can add any scales of measure in your domain that you've learned. So this is uh, corporate learning, another important idea in uh, value agile, that you incrementally uh, learn and collect the learning and share it. Um, here is from uh, a, a workshop in London where we decided to look at the uh, uh, polluted air in London. And uh, so, so uh, here, here's like the London pollution value set. And then here are the separate values. One thing we've learned is that a very good way of uh, managing and quantifying values is to decompose into subvalues, which we've done here. I call this Cartesian decomposition, guess why, basic scientific method. And uh, uh, it turns out if you decompose, it will seem easier to quantify than if you didn't. Okay, and that's all I have time to teach uh, there. Now, here is a full-blown one-page, one-window uh, requirement for air quality. It is, in fact, exactly that one there, okay? But uh, that's just the tag or the name. But we know that it's that one because we got air quality, and there can't be two air qualities in the same system of thought. And uh, here's the bullshit ambition level, drastically improve air quality in London to acceptable legal levels as stated in the Paris Accord. Okay, so good. Now, what is it drastically? How much is that? And by the way, when? And what kind of air quality? And all kinds of air. So here, uh, my students have co uh, concocted a, a, a scale of measure, number of persons, scale, um, scale parameter, who reside in London, Burroughs, dying from exposure over time to pollution. We'll define what kind of pollution per year in an area. And here's, here's uh, for example, a goal uh, to get down to 150 uh, uh, people uh, for senior people, you know, the ones who die most easily of COVID. And pollution is uh, uh, NO2, and the area is Greater London, and the date is a hell of a long way off, 2029. Okay. Now, uh, what I'm trying to show you here is how does a whole value requirement look? Uh, that is going to be used to manage your value agile or your business agile. And it looks like this. You can do this in pen and paper. You can do it uh, on spreadsheets or word processors. And uh, many people have built pretty good private tools with spreadsheet software. Uh, Sun Kai spent a couple decades building tools with it. But we have a, a new tool called Valplan we use on all the courses, and you're looking at it here, and it does a lot of, it knows language intimately and uh, helps us a lot. So, okay, um, next, okay, now here's the scale of measure. This is what we call a one-liner, and all of these have a capability of getting more detail if you click on them. So I've clicked on the scale here, now, here we have the scale, same one we just looked at, number of uh, persons who reside in London Borough, da, 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 da. But here uh, it, it says persons defined as. And now we have the definition of the set of things that we have decided to define and deal with. We can add to the set, we can change the set, but it is defined that persons is this set. And we can further define each one of these both in a hierarchy and a definition, if we want to, by, in fact, just putting it in square brackets, it'll force us to find. Here are the different pollution types, and here's some kind of a time scale. So, uh, so this is an example of an advanced way of defining a scale of measure. First, you have the scale parameters, and then you uh, have to define what they mean, and then we can select any set. For example, we can say, what is the most important 
type of person to deliver the early agile steps to. And let's just say seniors, because they're most likely to die from COVID. Okay. I mean, why bother with the kids? Uh, they'll be all right for a while. Okay. So, uh, and, and which one of these, uh, is the most dangerous one? Let's just say it's NO2. And, uh, what kind of a time framework? Well, 10 years isn't going to save any lives this year. So one month sounds like a nice uh, timeline. Uh, so what, what we do is we select the, most crit critical set by selecting the most critical there, the most critical there, the most critical there. And we say that is effectively what we're going to do on our early sprints to deliver value. We sort of sliced up a very complex reality. Uh, we have a model of it. We've not forgotten all the other combinations we haven't planned to do yet, but we can dive in and focus our team's efforts on saving the seniors next week. And as a senior, I'm just about to hit 80 years old. I really wish people would prioritize seniors before we all died out. Okay. It looks like the, the kids are, babies are okay for the moment, but not perfect. Now, uh, on that, uh, actually, uh, I think for the moment, I'm going to, given my timing, which is I'm running out of it, I'd like to uh, show you, uh, I'll skip over different points of scale on the uh, point, points of measure on the scale. You can read them uh, and uh, get on to something completely different and get a, a peek at it. But this is all the stuff about, now once you've quantified everything, obviously it is possible now to contract for value delivery so that if your sub-supplier is doing things agile, you quite simply say after every agile step, we will see how much of the value you've delivered and we will pay you in relation to the value delivered. Pretty dramatic, huh? Not in relation to how much code you've turned out or how many hours you've spent. We will pay you for value. I don't understand why responsible government agencies shouldn't demand value for money, except we know they're all corrupted. That's been proven by British Parliament long since with revolving doors. So, but it, it would be nice if we had ethical politicians and government ministers who did the right and honorable thing, which is writing contracts to use taxpayer money for delivering real change and real value, for example, for COVID-19. Um, I'm going to skip a lot of good stuff to get a, at least a little touch of uh, design theory. So, uh, and then with apologies, I'll probably give up the rest of it. Uh, obviously, we need more time than I thought. I, I thought I could do this much faster, but not. Um, I have a tendency to talk too much about a single slide. Apologies for that. Okay, so here we have our function oval. And here we have one value arrow, which means the variability. And here we have the uh, what I call the design area. At this, here we have our benchmark. That's how bad we are today. And here we have our target. That's how good we want to be. That's our success level. So obviously design has to fill this gap. It's a very interesting picture. This defines the concept of value design from my point of view. So, uh, I written a whole book this summer, finished about two weeks ago called uh, Systems Enterprise Architecture, which argues that enterprise architecture should always be in this mode of justifying their architecture in relation to the value it delivers. They're nowhere near that. They are a sham. And uh, my book is uh, trying to be very constructive in what they should do if they were sane or something like that. Anyway, that's the basic design idea. If you're interested in design or architecture, uh, you might have a bit of fun with my general theory of design and uh, it's built into the competitive engineering book and things like that. Uh, here is the value design book I wrote last year. Uh, again, a very agile design, not specially aimed at architects, this one. Uh, but uh, if anybody wants to look at design at the IT level, I'd say something like that. So in long 
story short, a, a good design uh, or set of designs needs to be good enough. So this is the effectiveness of the design. As we go to the right, we get more and more effectiveness. Now, here's our goal. So this design is a little bit better uh, than we need. So it, it, this design is uh, sufficient. It turn, uh, and, uh, and this design, uh, here's our budget limit. Here we start using money. And uh, a design that doesn't use up all of our money is also a good design. So these are basic qualifiers. We have to find designs that meet our targets. We have to find designs that can do so without using all the time and money and people we have access to our resources. Uh, skip that. Here's a subsidiary thought. If design A, B, and C are each good enough to reach our uh, impact, then we have to use some other criteria to choose them if they're mutually exclusive. So a very simple idea is we look at the cost. And in this case, um, design B exceeds our whole budget. Design A doesn't, but design C is even cheaper. So it gets very, t the best value for money is choosing design C. Now, uh, skipping all kinds of nice things. Let's see, what have I got? Ah, not too bad. Uh, I, I'll give you a little peek at my impact estimation table, and I think that'll be enough. Uh, you can have to read the other slides um, or uh, read the books or something like that. Uh, I have a tool for you, a major tool, which um, pulls together uh, all of our value objectives, all of our resources, oopsie, all of our designs and architecture into one table. And so if this is a design number one or architecture number one, then in this cell, we try to estimate how good it is. And later in the sprints, we measure how good it is and we compare what we expected with what we got right there built into, for example, a spreadsheet. And uh, we can do this for any number of values. Uh, again, 10 at a time, I think, is enough to manage at any one level. When you've achieved the 10, you can do number 11 to 20. There's, there's no limit to what people want. Uh, same thing here. When you have a design, you need to estimate its uh, uh, resources, both short-term, long-term, meaning like annual uh, costs for maintenance and porting and things like that, time, money, people. And so whenever you have a design, it's amazing how many architectural process have no culture of having value goals quantified at all. Some of them talk about it, but don't do much about it. I've, um, I've uh, written about this in the value requirements book. If you'd like to see criticisms of TOGAF and Zachman method and things like that. And they, they don't even try, but they sort of babble about it. And they're certainly no good at looking at the costs of their architecture. So I, what I'm campaigning for is an engineering view for the larger, more complex systems like our national systems in little Norway, not to mention bigger national systems in Britain, America, Germany. Uh, and uh, okay, so so uh, base, and now once you've got some numbers for the, the values and some numbers for the costs, you can work out a benefit to cost ratio. In other words, the efficiency of the design, there's a concept for you, or the uh, benefit to cost ratio, or cost benefit ratio if you prefer, or value for money. Now, this value for money idea helps us prioritize. As I indicated with the example of A, B, and C, choosing the cheapest one of otherwise equal value things, uh, we would, generally speaking, prioritize, that is, do early in Agile, anything which had a great value to cost ratio. And anything which had little value at great cost would be really stupid to plug in early in your um, uh, delivery cycle. So this is, an ad, this is a mechanism for managing smart, advanced, agile processes of delivering uh, the highest values we can at the lowest cost we can as early and frequently as we can. But anyway, this is like a theoretical idea of it. Uh, here's a real one. This is, uh, okay, that's my hour. 
but uh, this is actually used on a real case study. There's, there's the detail of pharmaceuticals that a British hospital delivered to patients using my methods. So here are some values. Here are some of their architecture. Here are some numbers and uh, things like that. So there's, that's nice because it's small, simple, and real. I think last slide, as I've reached my hour and it'd be delightful to have a discussion with you, uh, here's here's a, an impact estimation table in uh, using the tool. And the first thing we see is uh, we, we've got a, a short version of each uh, value here with the uh, with the uh, where we're starting from, and then there's the arrow moving towards the wish level, and here's uh, at least some of the scale. We can get more detail by simply clicking on the tag, get all the detail we want, but uh, that's considered detail enough for purposes here. Here we have a whole bunch of design ideas, and again, we can these are just the tags or names. By clicking on them, we uh, jump automatically to all the detail we want. Now, uh, question mark, question mark, question mark in this cell means nobody, somebody suggested database design, but nobody has evaluated how good it is for usability. And it could be terribly bad or terribly good or quite neutral. Uh, they think it's terribly good for database security. It, it, it uh, delivers 95% of our database security, which isn't surprising since it's a database thing. These things here are called side effects. This is the major effect, and not surprisingly, you expect a pretty good result from it. But good engineering says, and, and good um, virus development says, you check for side effects before you release the vaccine. Okay, so this is exactly that procedure that there's so much debate about uh, every day in the press. Why can't we just find a, a good vaccine and release it to everybody? And the answer is it might kill some of them inadvertently through side effects. Good engineering looks at side effects. And I believe that advanced agile will, uh, that is for larger systems, non-trivial systems, uh, has to look at side effects so that we at an earliest possible moment uh, uh, realize that this is a known unknown. You've heard that term before. I can see this is a known unknown. Uh, this is a, a nice but trivial result. Uh, this is fantastic. It gives us twice as much as we need, 200%. Okay. Uh, so uh, here we've actually added up if we were to use all of these techniques concurrently. And we have a notion of a safety factor that we have to have twice as much design as we theoretically need, which would be 200%. So we're green-lighted here, said uh, even in spite of this, if it doesn't turn negative later, uh, we have enough design there to feel comfortable. But here, and, and we do here and we do here, but here we have a little red marked 104, meaning we're, uh, uh, not least because of this negative number and some very small numbers here, uh, we don't have enough design to be sure when Murphy happens, if anything can happen, it will, uh, that the, our design might not get us to the goal we want to get to. So this is engineering thinking. And uh, I promise I, I'd love to go on, but I, I have gone on in uh, other uh, in the books, in the slides, and in uh, other things. So that'll have to be it. So I'll stop at the one hour and four minutes. Not too bad, Michelangelo. And uh, open up for questions.